My guest today is Professor Anthony Feinstein, who's a neuropsychiatrist with decades of experiencing researching multiple sclerosis and other topics such as traumatic brain injury. Today, we're going to talk about cognitive and mood symptoms of multiple sclerosis and what you can do about them. He's also the author of the newly published and excellent book, Mind, Mood, and Memory, The Neurobehavioral Consequences of Multiple Sclerosis. Thank you, Dr. Feinstein, for taking the time to do the interview. My pleasure. Thank you. You know, so I was kind of researching you a little bit, and you have a very interesting career path. You're originally from South Africa. You did a lot of your training in London, and now you're in Toronto. Can you tell us a little bit about your career path and how you ended up there? Yeah, so you, you're right. I was born in South Africa, grew up in that country, went to medical school in Johannesburg, and left during the height of the apartheid years back in the 1980s and went to do my psychiatry training in London, England. Um, I did my PhD at the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square. And I am of a certain vintage that allowed me to see the first MRI machine that came into clinical practice, which was one of these pivotal moments in medicine. It was really a transformative moment in medicine. And as you would know, within multiple sclerosis as well. And um, I was very lucky to be a student at the time. And uh, that's where I began my PhD work, looking at cognitive and MRI changes in people with multiple sclerosis. I worked with Professor Maria Rom at the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square, completed my PhD, went to the Maudsley Hospital to continue my psychiatry training, and then gave a lecture at a conference that brought me to the attention of some Canadian colleagues who invited me across to Toronto to give a lecture. And they clearly liked what I spoke about and they liked my research. And soon after that, I got a job offer from the University of Toronto. And I've been here since the early 1990s and very happy I am. And hopefully no regrets, despite all the snow you were telling me about just a moment ago. Um, you, know, so, <laughs> you know, so obviously Queen Square, very famous, a lot of the great natural history studies and early research in MS and everything like that. So that name definitely rings a bell. Uh, before we go further, just a conflict of interest statement from me. I was one of the academic reviewers of this book, and I was compensated for it, though this is quite a long time ago in July 2020. This is an independently arranged interview, not from the publisher. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, just to talk in general, what kind of cognitive problems do you see in people with MS? So the first observation is that cognitive impairment is actually very common in people with MS, and it can begin very early on. So even before someone gets the full diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, for example, if they present with a clinically isolated syndrome, like optic uritis, for example, even there you may find cognitive difficulties in up to 30% of people. The cognitive profile is fairly typical, um, deficits in information processing speed, so it becomes slower to manage information and to process information, problems with working memory, and episodic memory are typically seen as well. And then you may get executive dysfunction problems adding to the, the, to the cognitive compromise. But the quintessential difficulty appears to be that of processing speed. Things slow down and that can complicate working memory and may even indeed affect executive functioning as well. Yeah, I know there are a lot of studies that even like children who are diagnosed with MS, they almost never present with cognitive complaints, but with very formal testing, you know, in many cases, there is some degree of cognitive difficulty, even if it's sort of subclinical and, you know, performance can be worse in school and that type of thing. And, and we'll talk more about that, but just to kind of move to the mood symptoms, what are some of the common mood symptoms you've seen? Right. So, you know, the rates of depression in this condition are very high. Estimates are that one in two people with MS will experience what we call a major depression. In other words, a clinically significant depression over the course of their lifetime. There's also emerging data, and this hasn't been looked at as carefully, that symptoms of anxiety may be more frequent than symptoms of depression. So you see a lot of anxiety as well. And then, you know, finally, you get this interesting phenomenon in about 10% of people with MS, they cannot control the outward display of emotions. So they may cry when they don't feel sad, or they may laugh when they don't feel happy. It's a condition we call pseudobulbar affect. And uh, as I say, that might affect up to one in 10 people with this disorder. 
You know, I think a lot of people, they think that maybe some of the depression in MS could be sort of reactive depression, you know, having to deal with a difficult disease, that type of thing. But I know some of the imaging research suggests that no, there's a, actually a biological basis to depression. Is that true? Yes, correct. So, I mean, you know, I think it's understandable that people would think that when you've got an incurable disease like MS, that may be accompanied by significant physical limitations, that you would become depressed in response to that. In other words, the reactive hypothesis. And there's certainly truth to that. But there's also now an emerging data to show that brain changes may underlie depression as well. And should you have a particularly heavy lesion load in certain parts of the brain, parts of the brain that we call the limbic brain, areas of the uh, medial frontal lobes, um, anterior parts of the temporal lobe, um, that may be associated with depression as well. And it's interesting that when you look at, you know, multiple imaging parameters, so you can get a lot of MRI data from different sources, from structural brain imaging, from imaging that shows more subtle brain changes, something like diffusion tensor imaging. When you take all these findings collectively, the brain imaging data accounts for about 50% of the variance. In other words, the MRI data can explain a group finding about 50% of the uh, reasons why someone with multiple sclerosis might become depressed. So yes, and there's clear evidence now of brain pathology linked to depression in people with MS. Interestingly, when I was doing my PhD back in the early 1990s, and we had MRI machines that were not nearly as powerful as the machines now, my data failed to find an association between depression and, uh, and MRI changes. But with the advanced technology and the better scanning techniques, um, you know, the, the new data shows a very clear association. Yeah, and there's definitely new data showing that even the so-called normal appearing white matter may not be normal in real life. It may be dysfunctional, and it's obviously very hard to see gray matter pathology and other biological changes. Um, you know, so I, I know from your book, you're kind of very reluctant to talk about your patients, but... Could you tell like a few stories, you know, about maybe memory or mood changes in some of your patients and how it affected their life, just so we can see this more concretely? Yeah, you know, so what I did with my book to try and avoid disclosure is that I created characters. And that's based on, you know, cumulative experience, assessing and treating people with MS over many years. So when you look at something like processing speed, I give the example of a woman who was a pharmacist. She was working in a very busy hospital pharmacy. You know, things are happening all the time. And she's getting people phoning her and paging her with prescriptions that need to be filled very quickly. Has to multitask. There are many things going on. There are many distractions in the pharmacy because phones are going off, you know, many different phones, pages, etc. And as her processing speed slowed, she had difficulty keeping up with the pace of what was asked of her. You know, had she been given a single prescription to fill and more time to do it, she would have done it accurately. But that's not the way a hospital dispensary, a busy general hospital works. And in that environment, she just couldn't function. Another example was a, a man who had been very successful in business as a financial advisor. He was dealing with large amounts of money, had a very good practice and many clients were very happy with his work. And then in the context of his MS, he started to develop memory problems. He forgot to do things. You know, he forgot to place a trade. He forgot to follow through on an instruction from a client. And you know, this is a man who's dealing with very large sums of money. And when he made a mistake, other people, his, you know, his clients would suffer financially. And so there's very little margin for error in a situation like that. And ultimately, that put an end to what was the very successful practice on his part. Yeah, I've definitely heard many stories like that. Uh, one of my patients, he was an accountant, and he could do taxes still, but during tax season, you know, doing individual returns, he just couldn't keep up with the pace working 14 hours a day processing all that information. And so he had to give it up and go on disability. And I think a lot of people are frustrated because 
you know, many people with MS are highly intelligent. They appear to have normal cognitive function, but they can have this subjective feeling of what you're describing. You know, they call it cog fog, which may be sort of low, low processing speed or difficulty multitasking. Do you find that to be true that a lot of people are frustrated because other people just don't understand their symptoms? Yes, very much so. Because remember, you know, the presentation over here is not like Alzheimer's disease where you can see profound cognitive impairment in front of you. I mean, occasionally you will see that in people with MS. But you're right, for the most part, um, it's more subtle. But if you've got a job that you need your cognitive abilities for, in other words, you know, an investor, a pharmacist, where you basically live on your smarts, you've got to have impaired cognition, there's very little a leeway for impairment because impairment can mean marked dysfunction. So I see that all the time. The other thing that's interesting, if you sat in a waiting room outside my office, you know, in pre-COVID days when people used to come into hospital, you would see people walk into my office and you would say, you know, they don't have MS. They walk just fine. There's no cane, et cetera. But their disability, which is profound, might be cognitive. Absolutely. And of course, there are many other invisible symptoms in MS we won't talk about, like pain and things like that, and fatigue, which is difficult to measure. You know, so there is kind of a difference between motor symptoms, which we could measure very objectively and easily, you know, muscle strength or walking speed. But, you know, for the purposes of research, we have to measure uh, cognitive function. And you talk in your book about different ways to do that. Can you talk a little bit about that? How can we like objectify and research cognitive dysfunction in MS? Yeah. So, you know, there's now a recognition that every patient with multiple sclerosis should have a cognitive assessment. That's part of good clinical care. And the assessment entails neuropsychological testing. So there are good tests to tease out deficits in processing speed, different aspects of working memory, executive function problems, visual spatial limitations. So we put people through a battery of cognitive tests. There are brief screening batteries that could take maybe 10 minutes to complete, which are very useful. And then you have the more comprehensive battery that can take you know, 90 minutes, two hours, or a bit longer, depending on the level of deficits. There is also a movement to say that everyone with multiple sclerosis should have at least one test of processing speed. So even if you go and see a neurologist, ideally, within a busy neurological practice, there should be scope for a quick test of processing speed. And the test that's recommended is something called the simple digit modalities test, which takes about 90 seconds to perform. So it's quick, it's not onerous, and it gives you some really useful information on processing speed. So, you know, kind of moving on to what can we do about it, you know, in terms of preserving cognitive function, aside from treating the underlying disease, you know, what does science tell us is the best thing you can do to preserve cognitive function over time? So what I tell my patients is you need to keep your brain active. You know, sitting back passively when you've got a disease like MS is bad news. The brain responds well to activity. So you need intellectual activity, be socially active, and get some physical activity as well, exercise. So for me, you know, that's like the holy trinity, intellectual, social, and physical activity. That's good for your brain. Potentially, it might mitigate or slow down cognitive decline. More actively, there's a movement now towards cognitive rehabilitation that's starting to show promising results as well. So evidence cautiously suggests that you may be able to improve some aspects of cognitive, cognitive functioning with cognitive rehabilitation. And you can target your rehabilitation according to the deficits. So for example, if there are information processing deficits, you choose a module from this rehab package that focuses on attention speed of thinking, speed of processing. And there are some very nice computerized programs that now do it, and which can be incorporated into rehabilitation for people with MS. Okay, and like, what about for some of the mood symptoms? Is the treatment of depression in MS the same as the general population, or are there some different strategies we could utilize? So in general, it's the same, although we don't have the body of evidence that exists within general psychiatry. But the American Academy of Neurology a few years came out with uh, treatment guidelines, and they said that the data is strongest for cognitive behavior therapy. So that's a form of psychotherapy that's used within general psychiatry, but it also works very well in people with MS who become depressed. Now, 
if you don't have access to a CBT therapist, then medication may prove useful as well. Although interestingly, there are not, there's not a large number of clinical trials of medications, antidepressant medications in people with MS. But what data there are suggests that the medication can help as well. Yeah, some people anecdotally say that some of the more activating antidepressants like Wellbutrin could be better in people with MS if they have fatigue and more of a neurovegetative depression, but I'm not aware of any distinctive evidence on that. No, you're right. That's exactly right. That, that's borrowed from general psychiatry. So Wellbutrin does activate. It can help with fatigue. A drug like duloxetine can help with pain, neuropathic pain, but also depression. Um, a drug like fluoxetine, Prozac, is also slightly activating. If you have problems with compliance and you know, people forget medication, Prozac is a useful drug because it's got a long half-life. So should you forget to take your medication one day or two days, you know, the blood levels remain fairly constant, so that's good. If you worry about sexual dysfunction, which is very common in people with MS, you want to choose an antidepressant drug that spares sexual function, for example, well, butrin that you mentioned, bupropion, another drug is mutazapine. So you do have some data to suggest which drug you may want to select. But that said, the empirical data in the MS world is lacking. Yeah. Now, I know this is kind of an ongoing thing. And, you know, we're obviously working towards better and more evidence-based ways to manage cognitive function. Can you tell us a little bit about your ongoing research and neurorehabilitation? Yeah, thank you. So um, I have a grant from the MS Society of Canada, which focuses specifically on people with progressive MS. And the idea behind it is, can you improve cognitive dysfunction in individuals with more advanced multiple sclerosis? And this is a multi-center, 11 center, six country study, Canada, the United States, England, Denmark, uh, Belgium, and Italy, in which we are bringing together a coalition of skilled MS researchers with the hypothesis that aggressive cognitive rehabilitation plus aerobic exercise can bring about cognitive improvement even in individuals with advanced multiple sclerosis and a high disability score. It's a study that's been, you know, been, been influenced right now by the pandemic, which has slowed us down, but we're still going strong. We've recruited close to 300 people with progressive MS, which makes it the largest cognitive rehabilitation study for progressive MS. And the beauty of it is that, you know, we're providing interventions across languages and across countries to see whether if the model works in Toronto, it's also going to work in Milan or in London or Birmingham, Alabama. So we want to make sure that there's going to be a universality of finding, a universality of data. So it's an interesting study. It's well advanced. And I hope to have the preliminary data available by the middle of next year. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I'm definitely encouraged. And I think that we'll probably see results. You know, I know it's difficult to prove what we all kind of know intuitively, but it's very important research. Uh, do you have any other final thoughts or advice for people with MS? You know, what I'm seeing in my clinical practice now reflects one of the new realities in Canada, which is that cannabis has been legalized. And so I'm asked frequently about cannabis use in people with multiple sclerosis. And, you know, I listen very carefully to my patients when they tell me that they find the drug beneficial. If this is their experience, then, you know, I don't dispute it. But we do have some pretty good research data showing that one aspect of cannabis, the THC component, may worsen cognitive difficulties. So I raise it as a cautionary note. You know, if cannabis is helping you, that's great. But like any drug, weigh up the benefits and the side effects. And there is an emerging literature to suggest that if you use cannabis every day for pain, for insomnia, for anxiety, whatever, there may be some cognitive side effects as well. So be careful of that. Well, that's certainly reasonable. You got to be careful of everything, even things that are safe in the short run. Again, thank you, Dr. Feinstein, for doing the interview. Please check out his book, Mind, Mood, and Memory, The Neurobehavioral Consequences of Multiple Sclerosis. And hopefully we're at the peak of COVID and we'll see some rapid declines shortly. Take care. Good. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.